Welcome to One Hour Intern. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with two-time acting director of the CIA, now a New York Times bestseller, risk consultant of the highest regard, and successful podcaster himself, Mike Morrell. Mike, thanks for being here. Uh, it's great to be with you. It's an honor. As an expert on national security and intelligence, what can you tell us with regards to national security and world order in COVID right now? You know, I think the main point to make, um, Will, is that um, even before COVID, we were at, um, you know, what I considered to be the most um, complicated, um, the most threatening uh, national security environment that we've seen since really the beginning of the Cold War um, as it relates to Russia, uh, Iran, North Korea, international terrorism, and most important, the uh, rise of China and how we deal with that. Um, and I think the point to make about COVID is that it has just made that global environment m much more complicated um, for two reasons, really. One is uh, one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're in the difficulties we are from a national security perspective is because the United States um, really since the second Bush administration has um, looked internally and has um, to, to some degree or another walked away from its global leadership responsibilities um, as, as American voters have increasingly said, no, you know, we got to fix problems here at home. You know, why are we worrying about problems overseas? So um, COVID has only reinforced that tendency. Um, and two is the Chinese are working extraordinarily hard to take advantage of the current environment to um, spread their influence, um, you know, both, both in an overt um, way consistent with the rules, which is, um, you know, sending their doctors and nurses and their medical equipment um, to anyone who asks. The last, the last count I saw was 112 countries. Um, but also to use their their covert messaging um, to try to undermine the United States and to try to claim that you know this is not a virus that originated in China. This is a virus that was brought to China by a U.S. military officer. This is the United States' fault. Um, China is the most effective world in dealing with it. Um, the United States is not capable of dealing with it. Its allies aren't capable of dealing with it. So they're they're using this in this struggle, this competition between our two countries. So um, it was a difficult situation before COVID, and COVID has just made it worse. And with regards to the election coming up, are there national security issues there? But also, what should people be voting for to kind of address the national security issues that you just mentioned? Yeah, so that's a great question. So really, there there aren't any um, there aren't any pressing front page national security issues that are important in the election. Um, you know, it's not like we're debating really over whether we should leave Afghanistan or not, or whether we should leave Iraq, or you know what we should do about Iran or what we should do about North Korea. Um, really, the only foreign policy issue that has salience um, in this election is China. And um, what both campaigns are trying to do is they're trying to paint um, the other guy as weak on China. Um, because everybody right now is, is anti-China. Everybody wants to get tough on China. I can't find anybody on Capitol Hill, for example, Democrats or Republicans who are willing to say anything nice about China. So this is the time to be anti-China. So both campaigns are trying to paint the other as weak and trying to look strong. But that is really the only foreign policy issue in the campaign. You know, most of the issues are domestic, um, pandemic, economy, race, income inequality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in, terms of, in terms of what I would like voters to think about, um, as we go into this election is that, is this issue of American leadership in the world? Um, you know, there aren't very many people alive today who lived through World War II. And we're, you know, we're, we're old enough to be conscious of the run up and then the war itself. And the main lesson of World War II, um, if you go back and read the history, and if you were alive during that period is 
in terms of your, your investment in the world, you either pay now or you pay a lot more later, right? You either, you either work now to maintain stability or you're going to face a much bigger crisis later. And that, that is exactly the lesson of World War II. And that's what I want people to think about, right? I know there are very significant issues here at home. Um, but if we don't deal um, with the issues overseas, we are going to find ourselves, you know, in a, in a very difficult situation where, um, you know, we could face another significant war in the world um, without American leadership. So I think that's the most important point I'd like people to think about. Do you think that current American leadership is doing a good job at playing that role or is it still waning too much? No, it's waning. It's waning way too much. And, you know, my my main critique of the Trump administration's foreign policy um, is is the the distancing ourselves, the criticism of our allies. Um, all of the national security issues that we face, whether it's, you know, with the ones we talked about, China, um, one we haven't talked about, climate change, uh, North Korea, Iran, terrorism, all of those are issues that no one country can deal with by themselves. The only way you can deal with them is through your allies and partners. So we actually need these people. Um, and we're actually much more effective working with them than, than having them um, drift away from us. And so if I had you know, a single critique of the Trump foreign policy, that would be it. We actually need these people. And you know, in, terms of, in terms of whether they get a free ride right, at our expense, um, number one, that's not true. Number two, you know, we do pay more without a doubt, but if, if you're gonna lead, you have to pay more. Right? If we paid just as much as everybody else, then we would have no claim to leadership. So leadership costs something, right? Um, in terms of money and in terms of, of commitments of people and their time um, and their militaries and their intelligence services. So um, you know, that's, that's a really important issue to think about. And if we're gonna be able to deal with these issues, these national security issues in a second Trump administration or in a Biden administration, we're going to have to do it through our allies and partners. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So now that we have some context about you, we should go back to before you were Mike Morrell, head of the CIA, acting director of the CIA. Let's talk about when you were my age. The year was 1975. Microsoft was born. And the song of the year was uh, Captain and Tennels, Love Will Keep Us Together. What was life like for you? Um, so I grew up um, middle class, slightly below middle class kid in um, a small town outside of Akron, Ohio. Um, my father was a blue collar auto worker. Um, he worked the second shift, so which meant he went to work at two in the afternoon and came home at 11 o'clock at night. So I didn't see him very often. Um, it was It was expected that... I was going to go to college. I was a first generation college student. Um, but it was expected that I would go to college at the University of Akron, which is right down the street from where I grew up, and I would live at home going to college. Um, so there weren't, weren't you know, big expectations about going to um, you know, a, a school that might challenge me a little bit more. Um, you know, in, in high school, um, I did not focus on academics until I was a senior. Uh, I don't know why, I just didn't. You know, I wasn't really pushed by my parents to study. Um, so I kind of goofed off a little bit early in high school. Um, and it wasn't until I really started applying myself as a senior that, um, you know, I started to get better grades. Um, and then that, that continued throughout college. Um, but, you know, I had a group of friends and, um, you know, I had odd jobs and um, actually I had the best job that I ever had, Will. I was, uh, I worked at the Cleveland Coliseum, um, which is where the Cleveland Cavaliers played. And at that time, um, Cleveland had a National Hockey League team. So they played there and rock concerts. And, you know, and I started out as a hawker. I started out selling popcorn. 
um, and Coke and peanuts. And um, I got promoted to be an usher. Uh, actually, best job I ever had. Um, you know, I saw I saw great basketball. I saw great concerts. I saw uh, Elvis Presley, um, Frank Sinatra. Um, you know, I saw all the I saw Muhammad Ali fight. Um, so that was, you know, it was a great job and I had a great time growing up. Um, and I really didn't, I really didn't get serious about what I was going to do with my life until senior in high school, first year of college. Did you learn anything in particular that you keep with you from that first job? You work. So, so I think one of the real, real important lessons, um, in life is, is just working your butt off just working really hard um, and particularly in the hawker job, it was commission. So, you know, you would, you would pay them, you would pay them like $20 for a rack of Coke. And when you sold the Coke, you got $24. So you kept $4 a rack, right? So how much you made that night depended on how hard you worked. So if you wanted to make, you know, if you wanted to make eight, 12 bucks, you could goof off. Um, if you wanted to make fifty dollars, sixty dollars, you know, you could do that. And so I really learned in that job the importance of of hard work, um, which went together with something my dad taught me, which was if you're going to do something, do it right. So you know, be as be as perfect as you can be. And when you put those when you put those two things together, hard work um, and trying to do something to perfection, you know, you're going to be successful at at whatever you choose. At, at home, how did your dad pass that value of if you're doing something, do it right onto you? Yeah, the hard way. So we had um, we had a, a, a woodworking shop in the basement. Uh, my dad was a big, big woodworker. Um, you know, and it took up it took up half the basement. He had everything. Um, and when I when I made something, if it wasn't right, he made me do it over and over and over again until it was right. right? And then when I was when I was smaller, to the point of tears. So you know that's that's where I learned that you know the hard way. And you know I've talked to my wife occasionally about. I wonder, you know, she'll say to me, "You're too soft on our kids." And sometimes I think I'm too soft on my kids because of how hard my dad was on me. But, you know, at the end of the day, he did, he did push me to that pursuit for perfection. Um, that I think is really important to my success at the end of the day. A lot of people say that perfection is the enemy of the good. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. Um, because if you settle for good, you should be surprised when you don't get perfection, right? The truth of the matter is, and I learned this from being um, a manager and leader at CIA for 25 years, is people will meet the bar you set for them. Um, if you set a low bar, that's what they'll meet. Um, if you set an extraordinarily high bar, that's what they'll meet. So um, I don't like that phrase because it implies that good enough is okay. And that implies that you can take it a little easy. So, um, you, you know, I like the the Peyton Manning pursuit for, for perfection, you know, the Tom Brady pursuit for perfection, um, because then all of your efforts are aimed at, you know, being as good as you can be. And I think that's a much better attitude to have than good enough. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Were there any other important values or messages that your parents really emphasized and passed on to you when you were at home with them? Yeah, I think, you know, this, this, this notion of hard work, which got reinforced um, at, you know, my first job I ever had um, as, as that hawker. Um, my mom was the first one to, to teach me that. Um, my mom was a homemaker. You know, she didn't, she didn't have a job, stayed at home, took care of the kids, took care of the house. Um, that was a full-time job, by the way. Um, you know, she, she worked very hard. I saw her work very hard. Um, she had this very strange habit, um, which I actually do a little bit now, and it drives my wife crazy, um, of kind of cleaning up the kitchen 
while dinner is being served, right? Um, so she was working all the time. Um, and so I kind of learned, and I learned the pursuit from perfection from my dad, and I learned this, you know, work really, really, really hard from my mom. And, you know, it's that combination I talked about earlier that's so powerful. Yeah, definitely. What about with regards to your siblings? Did your relationship with them have a big impact on you? I don't think so. My, my sister was two and a half years older than me. Um, when she lived at home, we fought a lot. We were not particularly close. Our friends didn't overlap. Um, you know, given the, given the age difference, I think we were three years apart in school. Um, we got a little bit closer, um, when she moved out of the house. Um, we stopped fighting and we got closer. Um, we're pretty close today. Um, she still, she lives in Ohio. She's a nurse. Um, um, but I don't think, you know, I don't think she had a, a significant impact on kind of the way I approached life. Yeah. I think that's a good segue into now specifically about your high school experience. You said you didn't really focus on grades until senior year. So what were your focuses and what were some defining moments prior to senior year that you remember from high school? Yeah. So I remember, um, I remember sports. Um, so I was, I was a baseball player. Um, I was a wrestler. Um, I loved sports. Um, you know, I remember, I remember, um, being on a baseball team and we, we, went through the regular season undefeated and we got through the playoffs to the championship game. I was playing shortstop. So I was a, um, all field, no hit kid. I couldn't, I couldn't hit to save my life. So I batted ninth. Um, but I played great defense. Um, and you know, we had been through the entire year and we really hadn't been challenged and we get to this championship game and, um, we, we, we freeze up. I mean, we, we, we literally choke, right? I know what it's like to, to watch somebody on a foul line, right? In an NCAA, you know, semifinal game and, and they, they hit, you know, throw up two bricks of on three throws. I, I, I know what that feels like because our whole team did that in the championship game and we lost, you know, and I, I still have the, the, the scorebook from that game, um, tucked away. Um, but it's, it's really, th those are the kind of memories. Um, my memories with my friends, you know, walking to a Friday night football game, um, you know, first dates, you know, those, those kind of things are what I remember. I think, you know, I think, Will, the reason I didn't pay attention academically um, was because I wasn't challenged. Um, I found the classes, you know, boring. Um, and you know, that's, that's something that teachers need to pay extraordinary attention to is making sure that kids are being challenged. Um, and it wasn't until I started really taking classes that I was interested in and finding teachers who challenged me that I, that I took off academically. Um, yeah. so it, 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 it really was, I think it's a terrible thing to say, but the kind of a failure of the education system where I grew up to, um, you know, they, they, they taught to the bottom. They taught to the bottom of the class in the public school I went to. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't teach to the top. They didn't pursue that perfection I was talking about um, earlier. And I, I was just bored out of my mind. Yeah. I do want to talk about that, but first I want to go back to your choking in the finals. <laughs> How did you yeah. bounce back from that experience and overcome kind of the disappointment that one has when they go undefeated and then lose in the championship game? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think it's something that is something that stayed with me for, you know, the whole off season and, you know, you just replayed the game in your mind over and over and over again. I, I, I think by the time we got to the championship game, I had committed one error all year long, and I committed three in that championship game. So, you know, it stayed with me, and it really didn't go away until the next season, 
until you got back out on that field and, you know, you had three or four ground balls that came your way and you played them cleanly and, you know, you got your confidence back. But, you know, since you couldn't get back up on the horse immediately, so to speak, right, um, it took some time. Um, and, and it took, in my case, that whole year. So, you know, it's definitely getting back up on the horse and proving that you can do it. Um, but sometimes you have to wait a little bit for that opportunity. Do you have other fi- like major failure ex- memories from high school that helped reinforce that idea that getting back up on the horse is how you get over it? Um, that, I think that's the big one that I remember. Um, all of this, all of this is quite some time ago, of course. Um, but that's the one I remember. Yeah. So now back to challenging yourself in school and, you know, your motivation to start working. Do you see it as a self failure that you didn't pursue the challenge or yeah, they didn't pursue the challenging classes or the teachers? And would you go back and change that? Yeah, but, but, but yes, I would now based on what I know, but, um, based on what I knew at the time, um, I would not have done anything differently, right? Um, you, you know, you have to understand that I grew up in this, in this, you know, lower to middle class, you know, household where you didn't talk about academics. We didn't talk about, you know, what school are you going to go to? We didn't talk about what internships do you need to have? You know, we didn't talk about any of that. We didn't talk about, you know, maybe you should be taking the hardest classes. Um, you know, that just wasn't a thing. Um, so I wasn't aware of, 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 of any of that. Um, it's just not the, the segment of society that I grew up in. So I don't think there's anything that I could have done and it, it would have taken greater awareness than I had to have behaved differently. Right. Um, and I didn't get that greater awareness until much later in life in terms of I'm pushing my own kids, right. To do all those things that you need to do. Yeah. What about, you mentioned you spent a lot of time with your friends and going on first dates. Were there any lessons you learned from, you know, your, your friend group or unsuccessful first dates or successful first dates that you take with you now? Um, so yeah, plan out, plan out conversations. Um, so, you know, after a couple of awkward requests for dates, what I would do is I would actually outline the conversation, right? Here's what I'm going to say. Here are her possible responses. Here are my responses to those possible responses, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And, you know, I would actually apply that years later when I would, you know, have to fire somebody or I would have to tell somebody that they weren't doing a good job, right? I would use exactly the same approach. Or if I have to brief the president, right? Um, I'd kind of outline how the conversation might go and what I would say, if it, you know, depending on what the other person said. So that was, that was an important life lesson. I'm sure you never thought that your outline for your, your first date was gonna influence the way you talk to the president of the United States. How about that? I never thought of that till just now either. That's excellent. So now let's jump to your college experience. As you said, you went to University of University of Akron. What was that experience like for you? So that was um, that was a commuter school. In other words, um, most of the people who went there um, were first generation college students, and they lived at home. And they lived at home because they didn't have the money to go away to school. Um, and in those days, you know, uh, student student loans were not really a thing. Um, so, you know, for me, it was, it was college was less about the social aspects of it and much more about the academic aspects of it. So I was at the university for classes and for study groups, um, and things like that. And otherwise I was home studying. Um, so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot. I mean, I had some friends, I had groups of friends, but it's not like living on campus, right. Um, and being surrounded by your friends all the time. 
Um, it's not like, you know, spending time with your friends every night um, as you do in college. So it was really for me about academics. And in that first year of college, I got really interested um, in economics. And I actually got very passionate about economics. Um, and, you know, in addition to the classes I took, I would do a lot of additional reading on economics because I thought it was such a powerful, um, powerful, you know, explainer of not only the economy, but of human behavior as well. Were there any particular moments or people that experienced that fuel or desire to study economics? Or even yeah, to just, kind of, oh no, please go, please go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, I was very lucky to have a handful of economics professors um, who were terrific. Um, you were excited to go to their class. They were inspirational in how they presented the material. Um, I wanted to be like them. So, you know, my first passion in life was to go to grad school and get a PhD and teach economics at the university level. So I actually, you know, saw myself in those people. Um, they inspired me so. Um, there was one in particular. Um, he was a professor who um, grew up in Taiwan. Um, his name was Lung Ho Lin. Um, I actually, he actually hired me to be his research assistant when I was uh, only a junior. So I was his research assistant when I was a junior and when I was a senior. Um, you know, he mentored me, coached me. Um, he actually, he, he was the one who actually encouraged me to send a resume to CIA um, when I wanted to go off to grad school. So he was part of that story. Um, but I was very lucky to have you know, a group of professors who, you know, I couldn't wait to get to their class. And that mentality seems pretty different than your high school mentality. You seem like you became a lot more aware of the importance of academics and the importance of putting in the effort in school. What really helped you re reach that awareness? Yeah, I think there's two things. Um, I think there's two things. One is, one is I'm what I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, when you're taking classes that you want to take, right, as opposed to classes that you have to take and you might not like the, you might not be interested in the material. You know, all of a sudden you're taking classes that interest you. All of a sudden you're taking classes that you're passionate about. So I think that's one thing. I think the other is that the, you know, the teenage brain takes a while to um, mature. And I think in my case, it took a little longer. Um, and, you know, there was actually a point in high school, I think, where there was a bit of a light switch um, in my ability to comprehend really complex material. Um, and by the time I was a freshman in college, um, you know, I could do that with ease, you know, and that's, you know, and, and you may know economics, you know, is really challenging in that regard. Um, I remember in my freshman calculus class that um, I got a hundred on every quiz and every exam. And the professor, the professor, the professor said, um, you know, you can, you can drop your lowest grade. So when we got to the final, I, I had, I had a hundreds on everything. So I said, I'm not going to take the final. I'll take a zero on the final, right. And drop it. And he actually said, well, that that's too bad for me because now I'm going to have to produce my own answer key. I was using your exams before as the answer key. So there was there was this light switch where where I went from, you know, struggling a little bit to understand like geometry in, you know, I don't know what grade I took it, but, you know, struggling a bit to understand geometry, or algebra true to, you know, really being able to understand calculus my freshman year. So I think it it's a combination of both of those things. So and this I think question that, is not. Oh no! Go, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was just going to add that in my experience, um, you know, I think that that maturing, that maturing of the teenage brain actually takes longer for boys than it does for girls. Um, I think it's just one of the reasons why you, why you see girls, um, you know, outperform boys um, in in high school typically. Not always, but typically. 
Um, and so, you know, maybe I was a little slow, but, you know, I might have been right in there with a pack of some of my friends too. So this next question is not specifically about you, but do you think there's a way that young adults can accelerate that light switch or kind of some advice you can give to them so that they're not put down by the struggle of understanding complex ideas and that eventually they'll get to it? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think just knowing that is really important, right? Um, and, you know, I've seen it in my own kids and, you know, I've talked to them about it. So, you know, an awareness of it, I think, is really important. Um, and then I think there probably are things you can do to speed it up. Um, there's probably some classes you can take. Um, there's some things you can do outside of school um, to speed it up. Uh, but, you know, some different kinds of tutoring. Um, but I think the most important thing is just being aware of it. Um, and just because you don't get it this year doesn't mean you won't get it next year. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not forever that you're not going to understand calculus, right? That in, in, in a year or two years, it's going to be, com it, it, it may well be completely different. That's, that is, I think, empowering just to know that. Yeah. So now back to you, like you mentioned, you were super passionate about economics. And so you ended up going to Georgetown to get an, an MA or a master's in, in economics. Can you talk about that experience? Yeah. So, um, so, I went to CIA first. So, um, so I was, you know, throughout my undergraduate years, I wanted to go to grad school, get a PhD and teach. Um, and I had applied to a number of grad schools. By this time, I have a different appreciation of academics, right? And so I have applied to the elite, the elite um, graduate schools in economics. And I got into them. So I was accepted at the University of Chicago PhD program in economics. And that's where I was going to go. But I had this, I had this teacher from Taiwan um, who really encouraged me to, to um, send an application to the agency. I don't know why he did that. Um, he died early in life. Um, he died from cancer. Um, you know, I think my first five years at the agency. So I was never really able to talk to him about, you know, why he encouraged me to do that, but he did. So I sent, um, I sent an application and the agency invited me to Washington for a set of interviews over two days, 10 interviews over two days. Um, and I went to Washington, not to interview with CIA. I went to Washington because I had never been to Washington DC before. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to go to University of Chicago. I'm going to get a PhD, but I'm going to, on the taxpayer's dime, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see our nation's capital. So that's why I went. Um, I went with the intention of, of if they offered me a job saying no. So in these, in these 10 interviews over two days, I was, I was really moved. I was really blown away by the mission of the place which is to keep the country safe at the end of the day and the stories they told around that. I was blown away by the capabilities of the place, at least the ones that they could show me and those were quite limited, but uh, I was quite impressed by their capabilities. And then most important, I was, I was really impressed and blown away by the people that I met. Um, they were brilliant. Um, they were nice. Um, there was a very strong sense of family and sense of community in the place that you could feel when you kind of walked in the door and in the conversations that you had. And then on that second day of interviews, um, every single person said to me, you know, this grad school thing that you keep on talking about, this grad school thing that you kept on talking about yesterday to everybody who interviewed you. Um, if you come to work here, we'll, we'll pay for your graduate school, right? As soon as you start working here, we'll send you to the Georgetown master's program in economics at night and we'll pay for that. And if things go well for you career wise, after a couple years, we'll send you back full time to work on your PhD in economics. Um, and we'll pay your salary 
and we'll pay your tuition during that during those 12 months. And they ultimately did that after I was there for four or five years. So they came through with that. And, you know, um, putting all that together, when they offered me the job, I said yes, and I never looked back. So I didn't start the grad program until I was actually working there. So as an outsider looking at your story, it seems like in that particular moment, you really just took advantage of the opportunities that were presented to you, the hand that you were dealt. Would you say that that's a an appropriate way of describing that series of events? Yes, exactly. And I think the lesson for people, right, is being open-minded um, about the opportunities that are put in front of you. You know, you remember I went there with zero intention of, 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 of accepting a job. Um, I felt zero pressure, zero stress in all of those interviews because I didn't care how well I was doing, right? So I was completely relaxed, um, which was probably a benefit to me at the end of the day. Um, but I think the really important lesson, and there'll be later examples as we go through my career here, um, of, of you know, thinking you're going in one direction, wanting to go in one direction, and then having an opportunity open up and really making sure that you think through that opportunity, um, you know, without, without, um, without sticking to that original road, right, no matter what happens. This is an opportunity for you to uh, tell a funny story or embarrassing memory from your life. Is there anything that comes to mind? So, well, there are so many things that, that come to mind. Um, I think, I, I think the story I'll tell is um, so. I, so, so you mentioned that I was acting director of the CIA twice. Um, the second time I was acting director. Um, between Dave Petraeus's um, leaving government and John Brennan taking over the CIA, um, my wife and I went out for dinner um, in Washington, D.C. And we were in um, our armored SUV. And the difference between the deputy director of CIA and the director of CIA or acting director of CIA in terms of security is if you're deputy director, you have one armored SUV with two security guys if you are the acting director or the director, you have, you have two SUVs with four guys. So because I was acting director, we had two SUVs. And so we pull into this parking um, lot of this restaurant, and there's a guy standing in the parking lot with his back against the wall of the restaurant, and he's looking at these two huge armored SUVs. And you can tell by the look on his face that he's trying to figure out who this is, right? Is this Michelle Obama? Is this Secretary Kerry? You know, who is this? And he's on my wife's side of the car. So when my wife gets out of the car, he says to her, is that somebody important? And without missing a beat, she says, no, he's just acting important. So that's pretty funny. I didn't I mean, think it was so funny. I, I agree. That's pretty funny. But did you get her back is the question. She shoots you down. And how do you come back? Eventually, how do you respond? Eventually, yes. Well, probably no, because she like rules the roost. So, um, which you'll learn someday too. So. so now that we've taken a break, we've laughed. Let's go back to your career life at the CIA. When you started working there, what was the day in your life like? So um, I grew up on the analytic side of the agency. So the CIA has um, three, three main missions. Um, one is to recruit other human beings to spy for the United States. So those are what we call case officers or operations officers. Um, one is covert action, which is actually um, um, a type of foreign policy that falls somewhere between diplomacy and military action. Um, you know, a, example is the is the arming of the um, the arming of the opposition fighters in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. That was a CIA covert action. Um, and then the other is what I grew up doing, which is all source analysis. 
um, which is why the CIA was formed. So if you go back to the original um, reason for the formation of the CIA and the original legislation that created it, it talks about this analysis job. And the reason the agency was created is because the US government had every bit of information that it needed to know in advance that the Japanese were gonna attack Pearl Harbor. There just wasn't anybody who put it together, put, the, put all the pieces together. So that's why CIA was formed. So that's what I grew up doing. Um, and when I first started there, I was working on, um, I was working on global energy markets. Um, this was during the second oil crisis, the Iran-Iraq war. So there was great interest in uh, the price of oil and where it was going and um, how people were dealing with it and some of the national security implications of that. Um, so a typical day is, you know, you're working on a number of different um, projects. You're working on kind of short term projects, answering, you know, a president's question or a secretary of state's question. You're working on a, you know, a, a a short, uh, a kind of a medium term project that that might be a three or four page, page paper and you're working on, you know, a longer research paper at the, all at the same time. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going through all of the available information and trying to make sense of it um, for the president and his or her national security team. So that's what a typical day was like. A lot of writing, a lot of research, a lot of writing, a lot of, um, a lot of people editing your writing, um, which is quite challenging, particularly for those people who did really well in college. Um, you know, it's it, it's really hard to have been gotten straight A's in high school, which I didn't do, straight A's in college, which I did, um, and then walk into a job where the first thing you write comes back with more red on it than you can possibly imagine, right? And how do you deal with that? Um, that's a big factor in who succeeds and who doesn't um, at a place like the agency. So that's that was a typical day. Um, after a couple of years of doing energy, I switched to doing um, East Asia. Um, I worked a little bit on Southeast Asia. I worked a little bit on Japan. I worked a little bit on China, and I worked a lot on North Korea. Um, I was part of the very small part, a, a part of the team that discovered. Um, the North Korean nuclear weapons program in the early 1990s. Um, but yeah, that's what a kind of a typical day and a typical job was like. And I did, I did East Asia um, for either as an analyst or as a manager of analysts for the next 15 years. So the first 16 years of my career was, um, was being an analyst or a manager of analysts. So I want to talk about the specific events, but my question, my first question is, how do you deal with getting all those red marks on your paper so that you can keep moving forward and have as much success as you had at the CIA? Yeah. So here's the trick. Um, for those people who react to all that red by saying, what can I learn here? You know, why were these changes made? so that I can understand them and so that I won't make the same mistake again, those people do really, really well. For those people who react to all the red by saying, oh, it doesn't matter what I do, they're going to always change it, right? So I, I really don't have anything to learn here. Those people are going to fail. Um, and maybe to, to kind of drive the point home, when I became a first line supervisor. So I'll, you know, one day I'm an analyst in this team of 10 people and the next day I'm in charge of them all. Um, when that happened, we were working for a second line supervisor that had a very, very heavy pen. And so what I told my team was, let's take, let's take two, a two or three day timeout and let's take the last 20 things that we sent to this to this second line supervisor, you know, that came back with all of the red and let's analyze his changes. And we ended up putting those changes and we found that those changes fit neatly into seven or eight categories. 
And when you looked at the seven, eight categories, we said, okay, we're not going to make that mistake again. And, you know, we applied what we learned and all of a sudden our stuff started flying through this supervisor without any changes at all. So that's a great example of learning on the job as opposed to, you know, not learning and kind of rejecting learning, um, which I think is a real problem for some people in the workplace. Yeah. So you do have these steps up at, as you're working at the CIA, you go from an analyst to a, a line leader and a second line leader and then managing analysts. How did you make those steps up? What was your reaction and what was your path all the way to deputy director? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, 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 the hardest transition for me was from analyst to first line supervisor because my instinct was to do the analysis myself right to whenever an analyst who worked for me gave me something my instinct was to go through all of the raw reporting and kind of do the analysis myself and that's a huge mistake right your job is to is to is to make sure that what goes out the door is right so ask a lot of questions ask them to to make it better but your job is also to teach them right so that they're better analysts down the road um, and it took me a while to figure that out um, I was very lucky to have a, a supervisor above me who helped me think about um, what it meant to be a manager and how I should behave and how I should think about it, um, you know, kind of systematically. Um, and we, um, she and I had long talks about it. Um, and I really learned a tremendous amount from her. Um, and I was very lucky to have her. Um, but that was, that was a more difficult transition than any other. Um, so after I had, was a, a first line supervisor and then second line supervisor on these Asia issues, um, I became the head of, I started a series of kind of staff jobs. And my first staff job was um, the head of the staff that produces the president's daily brief. So this group of about 10 people who are responsible for taking all of the, the drafts uh, all of the first drafts, um, I mean, they've been through several layers of review and they come to you, but your job is to make sure that they are right and, you know, that they are written properly and written in a way that a smart generalist will understand them. Um, I did that for two years. The, the great advantage of that job for me was I went from understanding the CIA's views on a very narrow part of the world, right, just what I was working on. Um, in Asia to understanding what the CIA thought of every national security issue, right? Because I saw the president's daily brief every day. I put it together. Um, after two years of doing that, I moved to another staff job, which was to become the, the um, executive assistant to George Tenet, who was then the director of central intelligence, right? The head of not only the CIA, but at that time, the head of the U.S. intelligence community, too. So I went from understanding everything the analytic side of the agency was doing to understanding everything the entire CIA was doing and everything that the entire intelligence community was doing. So it was a great learning experience. And probably, probably most important, it was a great learning experience, not from a being a manager point of view, which I already kind of knew, but from being a leader. So George was, George was an amazing leader. Um, and to kind of watch him, um, kind of watch him motivate people, individuals and groups of people every day was a, was a great learning experience for me. Um, and then from there, from there, there's a couple of, of nondescript jobs that were in between for a short period of time. But when, when George Bush, George W. Bush wins the presidency in 2000, um, I had just come off working for George um, and doing a couple other jobs for a short period of time. And George asked me to be um, President Bush's daily intelligence briefer for his first year. So I was his briefer from January 4th, 2001 to January 4th, 2002 um, with him six mornings a week, no matter where he was in the world, whether it was the Oval Office, whether it was Camp David on weekends, or whether it was um, at his ranch in Texas, 
um, on long weekends or on um, on vacation for him or anywhere he traveled in the world officially. And during that whole experience, obviously you'd interacted with a bunch of major national security and, na and intelligence issues. Are there any in particular that you stand that stand out and that you can talk about freely? Sure. So um, I think the, the, the great value to me in being President Bush's intelligence briefer is I learned firsthand, sometimes painfully, I learned firsthand what a president needed and what a president doesn't need from his or her intelligence community, right? I saw how a president reacted to the intelligence that we were putting in front of him. I saw what was helpful. I saw what wasn't helpful, um, which I think, you know, was a huge advantage to me when I became deputy director and acting director and had to think about what we should be doing for President Obama. Um, so that was, that was, you know, a day to day learning experience. There was one particular, um, one particular experience I had, which I thought was invaluable. Um, one Saturday morning, um, the president was at Camp David, um, and on Saturday mornings, we, um, we drove to Camp David, the director and I drove to Camp David. Um, and there was one, one Saturday where the director wasn't available. So I was driving by myself and Steve Hadley, who was at that point, president Bush's deputy national security advisor and would later become his national security advisor in the second term asked me to give him a ride to Camp David. So we picked up Steve at his home and we drove him, you know, all the way there, which is about an hour and a half drive from Washington. So we drove Steve there. Um, and in that hour and a half, we had a, an extensive talk about intelligence, um, its role in policy, what's useful, what's not, um, what the level of responsibility that's on our shoulders every day is. Um, I remember explicitly him saying to me, you know, Michael, the, the president really trusts you and the agency. You know, he, he believes what you tell him. It really shapes his view of the world and his mindset. So, you know, what that means for you is you have a huge responsibility to get everything right every day. So that's pretty high bar, right? Um, but that conversation with Steve, I thought was, was extraordinarily important in my understanding of what very, very senior policymakers need from the intelligence community. Yeah. A message of, along the world too. I mean, you have, for everyone, you have a responsibility to do what you can. Not everyone's briefing the president, but you know, responsibility to be the best and do the best work. So and I don't, you're also, I, also say, I, I, I want to add something important here, which is um, President Bush shared kind of my management philosophy, which is, you know, you pursue, you, you pursue perfection, right? You, you try to get better and better and better. Um, and I remember one morning I showed him, um, I showed him a report from one of our chiefs of station in the Middle East about a conversation that this chief of station had with the leader of that country. And I was kind of proud of this particular report I showed him um, because the leader was, was quite candid with our chief of station. And I showed this to the president in his office on Air Force One, so it was just the two of us in his office. And I remember him reading it, and then I remember him saying to me, Michael, this is, this is all well and good, but what I'd really like to know is what is he saying to Saddam Hussein? That's what I'd really like to know. So he took you know, the bar from here and raised it up here in terms of what he expected of us, right? And and I really admired that about him in terms of, you know, he must have been a pretty good businessman because you know he kept on he kept on raising the bar. Whenever we reached a certain level, then he pushed up again. And I was very impressed by that. Yeah. So during your experience as a member of the CIA, you were also in the uh, in the situation room during 9-11 and the assassination of Osama bin Laden. Can you talk about what those experiences were like and how 
what that room is like and how you dealt with the pressure there? Yeah. So, um, so for nine 11, I was actually with the president. So I was with the president, um, you know, that morning in Sarasota, Florida, and then I was with him all day. Um, so that was, you know, that, that day will is, um, is etched in my memory every minute of that day. I could, you know, recite to you, it would take us four hours, but it, I could recite it to you. You know, for me, it was a mixture of the intensity of doing my job um, with the surreal. Um, so an example of the intensity of doing my job was um, as we were flying from um, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where we had landed to take on food and water, because we didn't know how long we were going to be flying around um, from, from there to off at air force base in Omaha during, during that leg, the president asked to see me in his office. So it was me, the president and, um, Andy Card, his chief of staff. And the president looked me in the eye and he said, Michael, who did this? And I told him that I hadn't seen any intelligence at that point, um, that would take us to a perpetrator. So he was going to get my best assessment, you know, my best guess. And he said, you know, I understand the caveat. Now keep going. Um, and I told him, you know, Mr. President, your your mind might go, you know, first to a nation state. And there are a couple of nation states with the capability to do this around in Iraq. Um, but neither of them have anything to gain. And both of them have everything to lose from doing something like this. So I think when we get to the end of the trail, Mr. President, we're going to find Al Qaeda and we're going to find Osama bin Laden. And I told the president that I was so confident of that, that I would bet my children's future on it. So it's kind of an example of the intensity of doing my job, an example of, and there were four or five moments like that during the day with the president, um, an example of the surreal as we were landing at Andrews Air Force Base that night, um, the president's military aide, the young officer who carries the nuclear football, um, was looking out the left side of the aircraft and he saw me looking at him. So he waved me over. And when I walked over to the windows, he said, look out. So I looked and there was an F-16 on the wingtip of Air Force One. Um, President's military aide told me that um, it was an F-16 and they were from the DC Air National Guard. He said there was another one on the other wingtip. Um, the F-16 was so close that you could see the pilot you could see the pilot's facial features. You could see the pilot looking at us. And in the distance, you could see the still smoldering Pentagon. And then the president's military aide said something to me that still sends shudders up my spine when I say it today, which is, he said, do you know what their job is? And not being a military guy, I said, no. He said, their job is if somebody fires a surface to air missile at us, on final approach, their job is to put themselves between that missile and the president of the United States. Wow. So an example of the surreal. So, you know, then fast forward 10 years later, um, and I'm with President Obama, right, the day we get bin Laden. Um, and there's, you know, there's so much I remember about that. I remember the first meeting nine months earlier when our counterterrorism the head of our counterterrorism center said to Director Leon Panetta and me, I have to see you alone in your office. And he told us about this guy that the CIA had been looking for for nine years and where we found him and the description of the compound, which was, you know, looked very, very sketchy. Um, I remember the first meeting where we briefed President Obama. Um, that was in September of 2010. Remember the, the actual op against bin Laden wasn't until May. So our first briefing of the president was in September. I remember that meeting like it was yesterday. I remember the president giving us two orders. Um, president Obama said, find out what's going on inside that compound um, and don't tell anyone. Don't tell the secretary of defense. Don't tell the secretary of state. Don't tell anyone. This was the best kept secret that I've ever been involved in. Um, and then I remember, you know, it's less the day itself. And I remember that President Obama, knowing that I was with President Bush on 9-11, asked me to go to Dallas two weeks after the bin Laden raid and brief President Bush on what happened. So I took with me the, the main analyst who had, um, you know, who could tell the story of how we found him there. 
and I took the, the planner of the military operations so he could walk through the military operations step by step for the president. And we spent two and a half hours with President Bush. And, you know, we got to the end and he said, Laura and I, we're going to go to the movies tonight. This is better than any movie you could possibly ever see. So we're staying home. And I remember him getting up and walking over to his desk in his office in Dallas and pulling out two challenge coins. I don't know if you know, military units have have a coin that has the name of their unit and usually uh, um, some sort of symbol of their unit and they exchange these. Well, he had, the President of the United States has these challenge coins and he pulled out of his desk um, three of his commander in chief challenge coins. And I remember he slapped one in my hand to give it to me and he shook my hand and I looked in his eyes and I could see closure in his eyes that I you know, hadn't seen since September 10th, 2001. So that's what I, that's what I remember from the bin Laden raid. Yeah. Wow. And all of those moments, there's so much pressure and so much intensity. And as you described it, it's surreal. How do you deal with that? Yeah. So I think it's when you're in, you know, I think probably being in the military is similar. Your training and experience just kick in. Um, so when I was sitting there with the president multiple times during, during nine 11, answering his questions, right. I didn't have to think about, I didn't think about what I was going to say. I didn't think about what I was doing. I just reacted, which, which, you know, is probably the way a soldier reacts on the battlefield. Right. Um, and so I was, you know, I was never nervous. Um, you know, I was never, you know, so in awe of what was happening um, around us that it took me off my game. I just think I just had too much, too much training and too much experience um, and enough time. Right? I was by that point, I was nine months, nine months into my six days a week with the president of the United States, and we'd actually become friends. Um, and he made me feel like I was a member of his family. Um, we used, you know, at, at the ranch in Texas, we used to talk about baseball scores from the night before, before we did the intelligence briefing. Um, so I felt very comfortable around him. And so I think that made it easier too. Um, but I, you know, it, it was probably more than anything, my training and my experience and then, yeah. then just reacting to events. Yeah. So I could go on and on with questions. We are, it's close to the time I told you we'd be done. So I guess we'll zoom out really quickly. I'll ask you a couple more questions and I'll let you go. I know you're a busy person. So obviously after the CIA, you have done a lot. You wrote a book, you've become a important uh, risk analysis member of uh, the business community and you've, uh, done broadcasting and now you do a podcast in all those experiences. Are there any big lessons that you take away or any big moments that stand out? I know that's a very large question. Yeah. yeah I think, I think the thing I would say is this, um, it's very easy today in the world in which we live to get pessimistic, pessimistic about the world, pessimistic about our country, pessimistic about our politics, uh, it's very easy to get down on our country um, and the people who run it. And I'll tell you that of all the things I do in my post-retirement life, um, which I really don't feel like I'm retired because I still do a lot, but you know, technically retired from the government, um, two things I do give me great optimism in the future. So one is the time I spend in Silicon Valley. Um, the time I spend with those startup companies and the entrepreneurship, the innovation, the creativity is just mind blowing, right? And, um, you know, there are other countries that, you know, have a little bit of that, but nobody has as much of those three things as we do. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm very optimistic about the future when I spend a couple of days in Silicon Valley. Um, and then the other thing that makes me, incredibly optimistic about our future is the time I spend on college campuses. Um, and I spend a lot of time there, um, different places, you know, some places for a day, some places for a week, some places for an entire 10 week quarter or 15 week semester. 
Um, I've taught some classes, um, some at UChicago, some at George Mason, which is the local university not far from my home. Um, but what, what gives me great optimism spending time on college campuses is how smart the kids are, how passionate they are about making the world a better place, and how much they believe they can actually make the world a better place, which is a really cool thing to see. So, yeah, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of you know, difficult things going on, but you know, when I do those two things, Silicon Valley, college campuses, I'm really optimistic about our future. Yeah. So now for the last two questions, first being, now that you've reached a pinnacle of success, what would you define success as? Yeah, so that's a that's a very hard question. Um, you know, I, I, I define success as achieving what you've set out to achieve, right? So if you if you um, want to be a stay at home dad and you are absolutely passionate about that and you want to raise the best kids you can, then the measure of success is how well you raise those kids, right? If you, if you working at the CIA and you have this passion to move up in the ranks and take on bigger responsibilities, then that becomes a measure of your success. So I think the important lesson here is um, to have goals and objectives, to actually think about what it is, what it, it is you want to achieve. Right. And that is a really hard question. And that can change in life. Right. Um, you can start your life with one set of objectives and then later in life change those. But I think you have to be conscious about them and you have to think about them. And, you know, you have to make them yours and not somebody else's. Right. You shouldn't do something because your parents want you to do it. You should do something because you want to do it. So that's how I define it. Yep. But it's a great question. And it's something everybody should yeah. think about. If someone was only able to listen to five minutes, what three takeaways should they have from our conversation or from your experience in life? Yeah, so I'd say, look, I think a couple things. One is, um, number one, don't guess at what it is other people want you to do, right? Um, there's a lot of people that ask me, right, um, how can I make myself more competitive to work at the CIA, right? Should I study Mandarin? You know, clearly they must be, they, they must be focused on China, so should I learn Mandarin? Um, and what I always tell people is, is focus on what you're passionate about, right? So if you're passionate, you know, if, if you're really interested in international relations, if you're passionate about Latin America, study Latin America. If you're passionate about the Middle East, study the Middle East. Um, because you are going to do best if you're doing what you're passionate about. So number one, do what you're passionate about, right? That's, that's where your life should lead you is to your passion. Um, number two is um, work your butt off. Um, I'll tell you, we did when I was when I was um, when I was at senior levels of the agency. We did a study. Uh, what determines success at CIA? You know, wh what was it about the people who made it to the top compared to the people who didn't? And we looked at every possible variable. We looked at at where did you go to school? Did you go to an elite school? Um, what, what was your grade point average? Um, you know, what kind of jobs did you have? What kind of experiences did you have at the agency? Um, how well did you do in those jobs, right? We looked, we looked at every possible variable. And at the end of the day, there was zero correlation with any variable we had. And what the people who did the study concluded, which I think is absolutely right, was the people who got ahead were the people who worked the hardest. So work ethic is everything. And then the last point I'd make is um, focus on learning is also absolutely critical. So I have this weird habit 
that I've had for a very, very long time. I did it throughout my time at the agency. I still do it today is at the end of a day, I ask myself, how did you do today? And I kind of, you know, before I go to sleep, I'm laying in bed and I'm kind of just going through my mind. What did you do today? How did you do? How could you have done better? And then I apply those lessons learned. And in that, in that daily conversation that I had with myself, I was harder on myself than any boss ever was. And, you know, learning from what you're doing every day, learning from your mistakes uh, is incredibly important. And I think particularly when you put those two things together, work ethic with this focus on learning, right? It is, it is hard not to be successful at whatever you choose to do. Yeah, those are great points. Mike, thank you so much for the time and for sharing your stories. It was great, to, it was great, great to meet you and learn from you. It was great to be with you. Take care.